Sometimes a silent hug is the only thing to say. Robert Brawl. I totally take back all those times I didn't nap when I was younger. Unknown. Let's just chop your ears off. Dr. Jack. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Elise Strawbridge. I am a sixth form boarder from Washington, D.C., and I have evil ears. I mean, they aren't evil now, but they were every day of my life until the eighth grade. Training my ears to be good has been an intense process. So that you understand the insanity that is my ears, I'm going to tell you a story. One day in kindergarten, I got in trouble for the first time that I remember. We were all told to gather around our teacher who was sitting propped up on a chair in the front of the classroom. I did what I saw all my classmates doing and found a seat right up front as close to the teacher as possible. When sitting crisscross applesauce, it felt as if I couldn't hear a thing. My teacher's mouth was moving, yet all I could hear was a slight mumble of noise. I didn't realize that my ears were the problem. I thought that it was my fault and that I just wasn't close enough to hear the words. I pushed myself up on my knees to try to get closer to my teacher and make out the words that she was speaking. It turned out that I was blocking the vision of the classmates behind me. They could not see the pictures as I had my head pushed as far forward as it would reach, trying to understand each word that the teacher was speaking. My teacher looked at me, annoyed, and said, Elise, Come out to the hall, please. She did not know that I couldn't hear. No one did. I vividly remember the looks from my classmates at that moment. Some were more interested in where I was going, and some were more annoyed that the story had been interrupted. But all the looks that came in my direction made me feel huge at a moment when I wanted to feel very small. My teacher brought me outside and with a firm tone explained why it was not fair to my classmates to block their view. She said that I was being selfish and continued to emphasize the rule against sitting on our knees in class. I was completely mortified. I did not understand the situation and just as any five-year-old would do, I simply cried. A few weeks later, my parents got to have a conversation with my teacher during parent-teacher conferences. She told them that I was a bit defiant and didn't pay attention. This information left my parents quite puzzled. My mom had always seen me as the classic first child who always tries to do everything right. My teacher responded by telling them that I would just stare at the floor and pick at the sole of my shoe. My parents asked about the seating chart, trying to see if that could be the issue, and they saw a very obvious issue right away. I was seated next to David George. I couldn't stand David George. Earlier in the year, he had teased me for having small feet, and from then on, he always made me feel uncomfortable. My teacher was excited that they worked out a simple solution by moving me on the seating chart. I moved away from my enemy, and everyone hoped things would get better. Newsflash, they did not. During my very early years, I struggled. It seemed that something was always medically wrong with me. My first exciting diagnosis came when I was a couple of weeks old and a holistic doctor told my parents that I was a failure to thrive. My parents then took me to a dietitian while in complete panic because their newborn child seemed to be a medical nightmare. This new doctor took my weight and measured me from head to toe, then compared my data to a chart and exclaimed, Take your perfect baby home and don't worry another minute. I don't expect to see you again. With a sigh of relief, my parents took me home, fired my first doctor, and then hired my current day pediatrician, whom I call Dr. Sparkly. Her name was simply impossible to pronounce as a small child, and it seemed that the nickname I came up with stuck for 18 years. As a child, 
I was always fussy. I came into this world screaming at the top of my lungs. Howler Monkey soon became my nickname as my screams would rarely let up enough to give my parents a break. Every time I became particularly irritated, my mom would take me in to see Dr. Sparkly. She would see fluid in my ears, give me antibiotics, and I would be good for a while. It seemed that during every vacation, I would end up in an emergency care place or a random doctor's office for more antibiotics due to an ear infection. My mom has estimated that I received over 40 rounds of antibiotics throughout my childhood. It is safe to say I ruined a decent amount of family vacations. A few months after that parent-teacher conference, my parents overheard someone discussing ear tubes for their ch children. A light bulb went off in their minds. Before I could take a second to breathe, my parents whisked me away to Dr. Jack, an ear, nose, and throat specialist. The first thing the doctor had me do was take a hearing test. This test consisted of sitting in a scary soundproofed booth and repeating words like airplane and cupcake back to a doctor sitting outside. It turns out that I failed my hearing test miserably. The doctor explained to us that my hearing was as if I was living underwater. For a five-year-old child, being told that you struggled to hear is confusing. I thought I could hear. I still heard sounds. Doesn't that mean I can hear? To my parents, this new diagnosis was a huge relief. All of the questions and confusions they had felt over the past few months now had a specific cause and a theoretically easy fix. My doctor told me I needed to get a small procedure to put tubes in my eardrum. When my first surgery was scheduled, I was terrified. But when the operation was over, I woke up with sounds spinning all around me. A little after I got home, I had to use the bathroom. I walked over and did what I needed to do. Then I went to flush the toilet. The second the flushing sound started, I screamed. The loud whoosh terrified me. It was so weird to me that something that I experienced countless times would somehow scare me, yet it did. I had seven more surgeries for my hearing loss after that, and time after time, the sound of a flushing toilet caught me off guard. Because no one noticed that I couldn't hear, I was very delayed in learning to read. I essentially missed kindergarten. I was always put in the slower reading groups and had to work with learning specialists daily while my classmates were coloring or reading on their own. It was isolating, to say the least. It felt like no one struggled in the same way. I found that the less I could hear, the less speaking was interesting to me. I never knew how loud I was at any given time, and I saw that as an excuse to stay quiet. The summer going into eighth grade, I got the news that my hearing was finally normal. With this came immense relief and a lot of anxiety. It felt that I had lost my only excuse for not listening and therefore not speaking. But since that moment of realization, I've learned that without listening to others, there's often not much to say. In order to articulate what we are thinking and want to say, we have to listen to others to gather a response. When I lost my excuse to not listen, I lost my excuse to stay quiet. In the years between eighth grade and senior year, I've learned to speak up and share my thoughts. More than anything though, I've come to understand the real value in listening and how it can shape every aspect of how you speak. Listening is a learned skill, and I, just as most, I'm not perfect at it, yet I try every day to be a better listener. My hope for all of you today is that you might truly hear each other and fully listen to what everyone has to say. Try to see if listening well can change your life just as it did mine. Thank you.